now to uh, share part three. You may have heard the story of the pastor and bus driver who died on the same day and went to heaven. St. Peter met them at the pearly gates and offered to show them to their new heavenly home. The streets were lined as gold, just as they had expected. As they walked along, they soon came to a neighborhood with beautiful mansions. They stopped in front of one, and St. Peter reached into his robe, pulled out a set of keys, gave it to the bus driver, pointed to this mansion, and said, Welcome to your new heavenly home. The pastor became absolutely giddy, thinking if the bus driver would be given such a palace, what must be in store for him? As they walked along, the neighborhood began to change. These were nice but modest ranch homes. St. Peter stopped in front of one, took a key out of his robe, gave it to the pastor, pointed to this ranch house, and said, Welcome to your new heavenly home. Well, the pastor began to uh, argue with him a little bit. He was surprised. He said, I don't understand. There must have been a mix-up here. After all, I've served the Lord and the church all my life. Don't I deserve something better than this ranch house, as nice as it is? And St. Peter explained, You see, Pastor, when you preached, the people slept. But when the bus driver drove, the people prayed. <laughs> Now, the theology of this joke might be a little skewed, but the point is this. What matters is who is on the bus and who's driving the bus. Think of the congregation as members on the bus and ask, is the Holy Spirit driving the bus? And where are we going? What is our destination? Where is God leading us into a new future? as disciples of Jesus. Let's recap for a moment. We are facing enormous cultural shifts and challenges in this country. And to remind ourselves that we are called to be this community of disciples. A missional congregation that understands it is primarily a missional community of people being trained and equipped to live among the world as disciples of Jesus. Its purpose to carry out God's mission of healing and redemption of the world. So coming back to where we started. As we face challenges in our congregations, in our communities, we recognize that from 1990 to 2010, those who identified themselves as Christian dropped from 86% of the U.S. population to 69%. The present rate of change, some researchers believe that Americans will be not, most Americans will be non-Christian by the year 2035. While 50% of those over 45 attend church, less than 30% of those under 45 or 10. Just one third of adults in their 20s and 30s claim to be committed Christians. Yet 80% of them claim that religion or spirituality is important in their lives. We have an incredible mission field around us. So how do we meet those challenges? It all starts with the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and 19. When Jesus told us to go into all the world and baptize and make disciples, our mission could not be any clearer. We are called to make this journey to the waters of baptism. We've been sealed by the Spirit. We now come to the table of the Lord's body and blood where weekly God renews our baptismal covenant of forgiveness, love, and salvation. We gather as a community of God's faithful and forgiven people. And as such, the whole faith community becomes responsible for those seeking baptism or those who want to renew their baptismal faith. 
We are a community of disciples who are always seeking out and welcoming newcomers to the faith and helping them on their journey of discipleship. And what does it mean to make disciples? Larry Osborne, in his book, Sticky Church, suggests there are three parts to this task. Number one, enlist new followers into God's kingdom. Two, train them how to live the Christian life. And three, then equip and deploy them into service. Peter and I were talking during the break, and he said, you know, if people are looking for authentic Christian faith, think about discipleship. And it's true. That's where we find where the rubber hits the road, where we're living out our faith in a tangible, authentic way as we live lives of discipleship and as we train and equip others to be disciples. However, the vast majority of mainline Protestant congregations in North America do not set aside time for newcomers to learn how to be a disciple of Jesus. Because most congregations still assume we live in a Christian culture and generally expect newcomers to know what it means to be Christian, at least so claims Jessica Duckworth, author of a new book called Wide Welcome of the Presence of Newcomers Can Save the Church. Wide Welcome of the Presence of Newcomers Can Save the Church. She argues for a more rigorous and intentional faith formation process for both newcomers and members, such as the catechumenic. The catechumenic. One of the uh, strongest advocates in your synod for the catechumenate is Clint Schneckloff. And he would be happy to share with you how that is making a difference in this congregation and community. Unlike typical newcomer welcome programs, such as a pastor's class or a three-hour welcome session, the catechumenate gathers newcomers and established members serving as sponsors and catechists, together to practice discipleship through Bible study, prayer, worship, and service. In this way, newcomers and members alike learn to be disciples through actual participation in Christian practices. By teaching people how to live out their baptism in daily life, congregations can move from a membership culture to one of discipleship and mission. The 21st century model for ministry is really a return to the book of Acts, which is a missional model where the focus of the new paradigm congregation is on discipleship, not just membership or maintenance of the institution. We need to keep in mind that the catechumenate is not primarily about increasing church membership, though we've seen in the case of emergent churches Many of those that are adopting the catechumenate as a way of training disciples for those under 50 crowd, they're reclaiming this ancient practice of the church. And it has resulted in church growth. But more importantly, it's about inviting people into a deeper relationship with Jesus and into dialogue with the gospel that leads them to discipleship. It's about Christian disciples living into their baptismal covenant. The membership question has been, how much does the church need? The discipleship question is, how am I being called to respond to God's gifts and presence in my life? Where is God calling me to serve? It's about building up disciples. The old paradigm for the congregation was creating better members for the church to serve the needs of the institution. The new paradigm is empowering members for their ministry and daily life. Reclaiming Luther's idea of a priesthood of all believers, that we are all ministers of the gospel. Helping these new disciples focus on ministries based on their gifts and strengths. Serving not just in the congregation, but in all the arenas of life where we are called to serve in our family, in our 
job in our community and in the wider world, living out the covenant of our baptism. You remember the words of the baptismal covenant? To live among God's faithful people? To hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper? To proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed? To serve all people following the example of Jesus and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Again, this new paradigm is a discipleship model that calls us to live out that baptismal covenant. Michael Foss has written a great book about spiritual practices for today's disciples known as Power Search. And he writes, the discipleship model expects the Christian community through word and sacrament to transform lives. To transform lives, both within and without the congregation. Let me tell you a story about another congregation in Seattle that was transformed by becoming a community of disciples and in turn helped transform their local neighborhood. Vinny Ridge Lutheran Church is on the edge of the inner city of Seattle. And like many congregations that find themselves in the city, it should be in decline. However, the opposite is true. 20 years ago, it adopted the catechumenate as a means of making disciples. It was intended for welcoming new people into the congregation, as well as inviting current members to go deeper in their own faith walk. Today, more than 75% of the congregation has participated in the catechumenate, in this adult faith formation process. This congregation is growing and thriving. People come from all over the greater Seattle area drawn to this high commitment congregation. One Sunday when I attended worship there, 30 young families were welcomed. A large children's choir sang and many youth led the worship service. Former lead pastor Paul Hoffman tells a remarkable story of when the congregation was invited to host Tent City. In the city of Seattle, various churches and other nonprofit agencies agreed to let the homeless camp out on their property for a month at a time. This invitation came in November for the month of December. The pastor and council president brought it to the congregation for conversation. Some objected that Tent City would be an eyesore, especially during Advent and Christmas, and it might deter people from coming to worship, especially any guests. What would they think? Others complained about what would happen to the grounds and the mess that would be left to clean up. One woman stood up and said she was new to the congregation, having been baptized the previous Easter. She believed that God was calling the congregation to serve the less fortunate. Didn't Jesus say we were to serve the poor and the downtrodden? Wasn't this part of their mission as disciples? And then another young man stood up and remarked, if we don't do this, we are hypocrites. And the whole idea of being a discipleship community is a bunch of bull. Our actions need to match what we say with what we believe. Unanimous approval followed, and being in a commercial area, the church gave the local businesses a heads up. What happened next was more amazing. The owner of a local hardware store showed up and offered to supply some tents and sleeping bags for Tent City. A landscape company came by and said they would clean up after it was over and restore the grounds to their original beauty. As people arrived and got settled, the local bakery was there to pass out muffins and other baked goods. And every morning, the women of the church would provide coffee and juice. And yes, the quilters got in the act and distributed quilts for those chilly December nights. Members of the congregation even brought Christmas trees and decorations to help the folks in Tent City have a more festive holiday season. 
And a local Greek restaurant that normally closed its doors on Monday offered to come over on Monday nights to cater a full buffet dinner for everyone there. It not only had transformed the congregation into truly being a discipleship community, but had made an impact on the larger community as well. I'd like us to now take some time at our tables for reflection on this experience. Let's take about five or six minutes. <coughs> and here are some questions to contemplate together. Do you think Finney Ridge was living out its vocation, uh, being a disciple? How were individuals transformed by the con by congregation's emphasis on adult faith formation and baptismal living? And what evidence can you point to that the larger community was also transformed? Please have some conversation among yourselves.